Is there a place for HRT? Is it causing breast cancer? What is the deal with HRT? Talk to me about bioidentical hormones. This is what the women want to know. Okay, good. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning back in to Reconditioned with Lauren Backneen, your one-stop shop for all things holistic health and growth, a place for you to learn how to heal, to grow, and to find your purpose. And I have an amazing episode for you today, the second episode I've done with Dr. Christiane Northrup. I interviewed her last season, head back to episode 70, to hear that one. I wanted to cover everything in that episode, but as we were speaking, I realized that that episode was very much about how to manage the emotions and the overwhelm and the frustration at everything that's happening in the world right now, and to use her immense knowledge to help us figure out a way to take back our damn power, which is the title of that episode. But she is the the authority on women's health, women's wisdom, and menopause. And so most of my listeners are women. Although if you are a man listening to this, don't switch off as you've heard that because there is so much wisdom and knowledge for you in this podcast as well. But as most of my listeners are women, mostly over the age of 30, we all need to start thinking about menopause. And the idea of this for me was just like how I prepared my body for pregnancy way before I was even planning on conceiving. In the same way, I am doing everything I can to help my body be able to transition into menopause more seamlessly when that time does come. I'm hoping that might be a good few years away, but if it's not, then Dr. Northrop has also given me the tools I need and the emotional tools I need to be able to manage all of that and to get my body to the best place that it can be to enable me to make that transition without too much suffering. Because what came from this episode was no, women do not have to suffer when it comes to menopause. And we also talk about the very contentious subject of HRT, bioidentical hormones, what other options there are. She talks about all of them and it's really interesting. So for those questioning and wondering about the options for menopause, we cover all of that in this episode. So I hope you enjoy it. As usual, please get in touch to let me know what you think of the episode. And before we get into it, a very quick word from our partners. I'm so excited to be working with Block Blue Light again. You guys know I talk about their blue light blocking glasses a lot, but I actually have new reason to talk to you about them now. So a lot of you know we're renovating our new house at the moment, and we have decided to go ahead and kit out our entire house with anti-blue light bulbs because of how damaging modern lighting is to our health and our sleep. We wanted to change everything modern houses usually have that we never question, but that are actually really detrimental to health. So in this case, things like not having dimmers because they release such high EMFs, electromagnetic frequencies, or not having LED or fluorescent lighting anywhere, which seems crazy to everyone because that's just what we're used to. We wanted lights without damaging blue light But in rooms like the kitchen, I really wanted to make sure I still had enough light, especially living in the UK where it gets dark at 4pm in the winter. And this was a little bit of a concern of mine because I still really want the house to be fully functional for modern living. But the Block Blue Light team created the world's first biologically friendly day to night full spectrum light bulb. And that's a lighting technology that really closely replicates the same visual color spectrum as visible natural light from the sun. And this sort of exposure to full spectrum light will increase energy throughout the day and uplifts our mood and increases overall well-being. And of course, these lights are super low EMF. And low EMF is something I've become hyper aware of in recent years and something we're really trying to focus on with this house. So for rooms where we don't need lights that are as bright, we've opted for their amber light and taken their advice on things like having floor and table lamps. So after dusk, we'd only have lights at eye height because our ancestors would have only had firelight after dusk, right? And no overhead lighting. And we know that when we mimic our natural states as much as possible, our health thrives. And we wanted to make sure we did this with our new home in every way we could. So they also created the first ever blue light free reading lamp that attaches to your book and it has three brightness settings, but no blue light whatsoever. So it won't damage my sleep in any way, which is life changing for me because I read in bed every night. 
Now, this is the third season Reconditioned have teamed up with Block Blue Light because we all know that healthy eating is essential and all of that great stuff, but not enough people know of how important reducing our exposure to blue light and EMFs is. And I really want to continue sharing this message. Sleep optimization is key to health and these products really maximize that. So you can go ahead and use the code LV20 at checkout on blockbluelight.co.uk for 20% discount across the entire range. Thank you so much to Block Blue Light and now an uninterrupted episode. Okay, Dr. Northrup, welcome back. Thank you so much for being here again. Thank you. My pleasure. So we had the most incredible feedback after your last episode, um, which for those, yeah, so which for, for anyone listening, that was episode 70. Um, and got so many downloads and just such amazing feedback. And it was, that episode was really necessary for us to focus on what we focused on to give people answers and hope, you know, about this crazy situation. Yes. But because you're such an authority on menopause, I wanted to be able to have, to dedicate a whole episode to that. So, yeah. So for those interested, I did read out Dr. Northrup's bio on the last episode. So just head over there or to the show notes of either episode to hear more about her very many credentials. But right now, let's head into it straight in at the deep end. Dr. Northrup, why do women suffer with menopause so much? Because it is another birth canal. Only this time, instead of giving birth to someone else, you're giving birth to yourself. And so it is truly a... Well, first of all, it's the Uranus opposition, astrologically, which happens to everyone, men and women at age 42. Now, that's not the age of the final menstrual period. The age of the final menstrual period is generally the age at which it happened to your mother, though many women have had hysterectomies, so you don't know. In the United States, the average taking everyone together is 52. It can happen late 30s. It can happen early 60s. Okay, so that's the range. But the reason that it is so dreaded is what's called really a patriarchal reversal, Mm -hmm. which is where your power is, is where you're told it absolutely isn't. Now, remember that which is feminine has been under the thumb of a system called patriarchy for 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. And that is, let me be very clear, that is as wounding to men as it is to women. What it does to men, and I was having this discussion yesterday with my personal trainer who was a special forces medic, and you know, he said he used to go to bars and pick up women, and it was so easy to do, and you know, that he's very susceptible to a pretty girl. Now he's married to the love of his life. We had a discussion about the fact that many men do that in the in the beginning because they're visual and they're whatever. And then we have the porn industry that has always been there, but came in in a huge way with Hugh Hefner and Playboy magazine. And I have heard that uh, Hugh Hefner is probably part of the deep state dark cult because we began to pull apart the family in a big, big way after World War II. So we got the Playboy and we've got all of that stuff and then porn so that men's and also women's visual cortex becomes addicted to certain images. And the images are all of basically young male bodies with big breasts. Mm -hmm. Um, The whole reason that women started to do Brazilians to remove all of their pubic hair came from porn movies Mm -hmm. so that you could see the money shot better. Same with bleaching the anus. It's like, when did that happen? And this all had to do with the porn industry. So imagine you are a woman approaching menopause and you have seen your value as your youth and your physical fertility and that's it i mean that, that yeah you might have done other things but as long as you had youth physical fertility some beauty no wrinkles then you had what what i would call you got um full service for self service prices <laughs> But then you approach menopause. I have a good friend who was a model and she said, I remember the time when heads no longer turned when I walked into a room. Now I wanted to give you the good news. If you're someone like me and heads never turned when you walked into a room, 
you're beginning to enter a time of enormous power. And then what happens is you're real. There's no question. Okay. That biologically beautiful young women have enormous power. They absolutely have enormous power. All you have to do is look around at these old geezers in Vegas, you know, with the, with the 20 year old and they'll, I had a friend who um, drove Ferraris. Uh, she didn't, her husband did. And uh, so they're very wealthy in Texas. And uh, so he would go and race Ferraris with his wealthy friends. And many of the wealthy friends were older men with really young women. And she and her husband have a great relationship. And she goes, honey, they don't love him. And he looks at her and he goes, they know that. Yeah. They know that. So it's, um, it's a commodity. So you as a commodity, your shelf life is seen to expire. And so women dread that because just by walking into a room or batting your eyes or whatever, you've been able to get something that you needed, some goods or services. And at menopause, here's what happens. Okay, first of all, let's be clear. We're immortal souls. We're immortal souls. So this is just a blip on the screen and really who cares? So that's the overall. But in your individual personal life, this means that the dictates of your soul need to take priority. So here's what happens. And I saw it again and again and again. You're not sure what to do with your life, but you're really good with raising children. That's what you've been doing primarily, let's say. And by the way, it doesn't matter if you have a job. There's something so uh, satisfying for many women, for most, not all, but most, of having children around, preparing their birthdays, driving them places. There's just something so satisfying that the prospect of the last one leaving home is terrifying. And what I saw in my practice for years and years is the oops, baby. Oops, I'm 42. And I don't, this is what I would hear. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> really? You're 42 and you have a PhD, but you don't know how that happened. Actually, what happens, what does happen is women in their 40s, given our culture, have been brainwashed that they're not that they're not fertile. So everyone's been taught that at 35, you better freeze your eggs if you haven't had a baby yet, despite a ton of research to the contrary. And so um, they think they can't get pregnant. The in, uh, while back, like 10 years ago, the number two most common age at which a woman had an abortion, number one, was in her late teens. Number two, early 40s. Because mm. she thought she couldn't get pregnant. Mm. But it's an unconscious thing where the woman does not want to move into the offices of true wisdom. And so she has another baby. She knows how to do that. And, and there's good things about that because there's a thing called priming. So, and I, and I want to get into priming uh, and it primes her to be around a lot of younger people and the women who have their babies late stay young a long time because they're always around toddlers and little kids and they're around what is youthful. But the fear of growing older and, and ultimately the ultimate fear, right? The one that's gripping planet earth right now is the fear of death. Oh, if I hug that person, I'll die. If I breathe in here, I'll die. If I, do, if I don't wear a mask, I'll die. That, that's what is driving everything. And in fact, the, uh, the fear of menopause is another part really of the global death cult. I mean, it, it uh, it makes us live in fear instead of live fully. So we have been slaves to that system. And the way out is to see the wisdom available to us, if we will take it, within that portal. Now, I remember being interviewed by Gail King, uh, Oprah's best friend, down in New York City at uh, Lincoln Center. So she has the book, The Wisdom of Menopause. 
And she looks at me derisively, which is how that book was received at first, like pretty much everything else I've done. And uh, the wisdom, oh, oh, are you kidding me? I mm. have hot flashes. I'm sweating. I, uh, you know, I'm this, I'm that. There's nothing good about this. So what you find in retrospect, when you look back for many women, this was the turning of, okay, so we're now in the turning of the ages as the human family and as the planet, but this is the turning age, turning of the ages for you as a woman, menopause. So here's what happens, and it's very cool. The inside of the ovaries, the, the stroma it's called, that produces uh, testosterone, tends to get bigger. The estrogen type on the outside, the cortex, not so much. But what it means is that many women, if they're healthy, find that their drive to going toward they want, to what they want, clicks in. And the beauty of uh, the Oprah show in 2001, when I was first on with the first edition of the, of the Wisdom of Menopause, is she got it. She got it. And so she, the B-roll at the end of that first show was all of these women who had started businesses, uh, left long-term relationships, uh, left cults that they had been in since they were children that were suppressing who they were. It's a, it's a crossroads. And so I would say it's this way, grow or die, grow or die. Mm. Pandemic, no pandemic, grow or die. And pl the planet's in the perimenopausal transition. Now, where many of us sleep, you and I, are choosing to grow in big ways. And people now are coming together. They're, they're forming community gardens. They're forming the way we want to live together as a community without fear. So in an individual life, so, you know, my story is very, very well documented in the books because I teach not only from my extensive educational background, but from my personal life, because that's really the only way we learn anything. So as I'm speaking to all the women who are listening, I would ask them if they're having their first uh, tinge of maybe sleeplessness, maybe hot flashes, maybe they've begun to skip a period. I'd like them to notice what is irritating them, is mm -hmm. what is coming up when their period is late or what is coming up in their life in general. And then of course, what's gonna happen, and I can just assure you this is what happens. Generally, the very thing you fear the most in my case, the end of a marriage, was what needed to happen. Now, for those women who have a very good job relationship, whatever, their irritation is almost, it's always, let's be very clear, this is where you get the power. The irritation comes from irritation with themselves with all the time they haven't spoken up, with all the time they haven't been true to themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the things, one of the stories in The Wisdom of Menopause that I tell is I was on a drug called Cinerella, a GNRH agonist, to shrink my fibroid before I had surgery. So it'd be an easier surgery. Well, that puts you into almost instantaneous menopause. Mm -hmm. So what might have happened over a three to four year period happened in about a month. And I, uh, my husband and I were watching a, an episode of the show ER. Now he is a surgeon, I'm a surgeon, all of that. And, but it's the story of someone who's burned or uh, is sick beyond repair. And the doctor in the, in the show is not telling the patient what's really going on. First of all, doctors often don't know what's really going on. So let me be clear on that one. 
and then they just blow smoke. So I've seen that a million times, but in this case, they knew. And I said to my husband, why do they do that? And he goes, do what? And I said, you know, have their hand on the doorknob when they're leaving, but the patient really needs them to talk to them at that very moment. And he goes, nobody does that. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Boom, yeah, boom. Being triggered. I just lost it. And I now remember at that time, I'm the past president of the American Holistic Medical Association. He um, never believed anything about holism. It was like living with, in, in retrospect, the, you know, the CDC or the NIH or, or whatever, you know, not invented here or the CDC COVID death cult. Um, so I finally, I, I had spent so many years trying to prove, prove my point of view, mm. trying to prove what I felt, what I knew, like so many women mm. whose voice has been discounted. And so what we do is we, um, pussyfoot around, we play nice, we, or in my case, <laughs> we give someone uh, a packet of peer-reviewed medical literature to review, <laughs> thinking that that's going to change anyone's mind. And let, let me just be clear, everybody, even if you are dealing with doctors right now, at this particular point in history, what I went through in my marriage is now writ large. The microcosm of your individual relationship with someone who doesn't respect you, doesn't listen to you, and can and will not open their mind to you, that microcosm is now global, mm. which is why Peter Bragan wrote the book, Peter Bragan, The Conscience of Psychiatry, uh, an MD, wrote The Global Predators, We Are the Prey, and Dr. Peter McCullough wrote the foreword for that. Mm. But in my case, I was married to a narcissist. That's a microcosm of the global predators who are psychopaths. But garden variety narcissism is on a spectrum like autism, little aspergery, adult in diapers moaning with no language. There's a spectrum. Mm. And that which we have seen as the way to think, the way to be, the way to feel has been what they teach in the halls of philosophy at Harvard and Oxford and Cambridge and Yale. And I was just uh, talking with a professor of philosophy who began to do a deep dive on all of the well-known philosophers, uh, Marcuse, a bunch of others. I didn't take philosophy in college, I was spared. But he said, you find out that they were actually uh, very mean, damaged people with uh, surrounded by a group of those who protected them. And they have, by and large, written the textbooks of philosophy that we all sit around at university uh, thinking that we should act and feel like this. Well, for women, we have a different brain. It's much harder to feel that way, to get out your cigarette and start to pontificate about <laughs> how ridiculous those people are. Don't, can't you see? Can't you see? Oh, my God. She wants to have children. She thinks that these little toddlers who are insufferable are something to be around. What an idiot. It's that that you can no longer play that game because your heart, your right hemisphere, your soul, which is goodly and godly, is coming up. And you feel like an idiot. I, I just have to say this. Uh, I remember a friend said to me around that time, well, you need a whole room to write. You need um, you need this and you need that. And I remember wanting to cry. I had this tiny little room and I didn't think that I deserved more because here's the way I had approached my marriage and my career at that time, which is this. And this will be hard for people to believe. 
but that was a while back. Things are better now in some ways, worse in some ways. I didn't want anything to threaten my marriage. Mrs. Da 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 the third, who I was, Mrs. Da 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 the third, and I'm a Libra, so conscious equal partnership was absolutely a holy grail for me. Now, just because we were both surgeons didn't mean we had a conscious equal equal partnership. I deferred to him around the money. I deferred to him around decorating the house. I referred to him around every major purchase. I deferred. I deferred. I deferred, mm. and I wrote my first book, Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom, in this little room in the house that we dubbed the Bat Cave. And I had papers all over and studies all over. And I would just try to fit in writing this book in between taking care of the kids, taking care of the house, going in to deliver babies, starting a new business called Women to Women and, and all of the rest of it. So, so the very idea of asking for more never occurred to me. My aunt was a pediatrician when very few women went to medical school. And when I got pregnant, and she never married, when I got pregnant, she says, oh, doing the whole bit, huh? So it was, it, it seemed too much to ask. And I would like, again, your listeners to ask themselves, what seems like too much to ask for? Mm. And Eventually, uh, and and I, my marriage ended the day after I was first on Oprah yeah. in uh, 1999. Um, the family didn't want to watch the show. So imagine at the time, now your listeners may or may not remember that the Oprah Winfrey show was a big deal for 25 yeah. years. Everyone knows that, yeah. Yeah, and if you could get on Oprah, it was like, the, whoa. Yeah. You know, we, wow, we were on Oprah. So I was on Oprah and then the show airs the following week. And so you don't quite know what's going to happen with how she's going to edit it. But I had been out to Chicago and the team had come to the house and they'd done the B-roll. And my husband was off on a, a hero trip that I had paid for. So he wasn't around. So I did all the B-roll and da, 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 da. And then the day came. Thursday afternoon to watch the show together on television with the family. And my oldest daughter was very supportive. The youngest daughter was pissed that she couldn't just be with her friends, that I was literally asking her to sit and watch me on television for one hour. My husband kept complaining, he kept making phone calls, and he kept asking me to check little things on his body. Like, did you see, I think I have a red spot on this ear. Will you check it? And in my, and then the show was over, uh, the person who was helping out with the children was supposed to make dinner that night. She was supposed to be in the B-roll for her cramps that she got over by following my uh, instructions. She was so angry that they cut it that she just stormed out of the house. And then I went over into my home office. By then I had a bigger home office that I insisted upon. And the phone was ringing off the hook with my editor from Bantam, with uh, my PBS producers, with everyone saying, oh my God, you hit it out of the park. That was amazing. And so it was, and life does this to us. So this is important for everyone to notice. In my home office, I had the whole world coming and telling me, oh man, this was amazing. In my home, 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 mm. I have no respect except for one, my older daughter. Um, no one can actually see what's going on. They're mm -hmm. all threatened. And that night I slept in the guest room. I said to my husband, I, I just think that I need to not be here. And I dreamed uh, that someone was in the house with guns who was going to kill me. And I was trying to do feng shui. Okay, here's what we do. Here's what we old soul empaths do when something isn't working. We will move heaven and earth to change us, to change our environment, to do whatever we can to appease the person with the personality disorder who is not going to change. Mm. It's cluster B people. That's why I wrote Dodging Energy Vampires, but that took until 2018. 
which I didn't, I never knew what I was actually dealing with. And, uh, and so I said to him, I'm really scared. I don't know what's going to happen with us going forward. And he began banging his head against the wall saying, I don't know what you want. I don't know what you want of me. So, which is a, a basically a regret. Now, remember, this is after three years of couples therapy. And so, again, it's from a childish, you need to take care of me. You need to figure out what I need. I can't figure out what I need. And it's all your fault. Mm. And he stormed out of the house. Mm. And that was the last time he ever lived here. Now, that's a long, long story, which is, you know, then I called a lawyer and I thought, well, yeah, this divorce is never going to happen. That's never going to happen to me. Um, I just think we need a break. So I saw the whole thing as, oh, well, the heart is in um, atrial fibrillation. Let's just bring in the paddles and do electroshock therapy and get the uh, signal going back to normal sinus rhythm. That's honest to God what I thought, because I didn't know what mm -hmm. I was dealing with. The kids and I all thought that he was living in his car over at his office and that he was suicidal. No, he was living in the guest house in the lap of luxury in the house of uh, his stockbroker. And it, you please understand everyone if you're if you're dealing with someone who does not take responsibility for their side of it mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to fix it so you grow or die mm -hmm. so what i know is had i stayed and tried to smooth it over and fix it i used to say um in interviews i knew exactly how to keep my husband happy I just got sick of doing it. <laughs> and I know that I would have, because I knew this from years of practice, I would have developed bilateral inflammatory breast cancer and I would have been dead in yeah. three months had I stayed. Yeah. So let me put that signal out there to your audience, grow or die. And when I say die, why do you think, why do you all think that, after the age of 50 on their tables of, well, you now need a colonoscopy. Well, you now need, you need, you need, da, 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 oh the, <laughs> you need all of this stuff. The whole reason why all of that or any of that increases after the age of 50, of course, obviously, if you have a crappy lifestyle and you're smoking and you're drinking too much alcohol and you're drinking, you know, eating too much sugar, that does eventually catch up but not nearly to the degree that unfinished emotional business trapped in your body catches up at a time of a portal of wisdom mm. known as perimenopause. So this is an uh, incredible opportunity. Now, we know that you've got about, I don't know, I always forget the figure, but let's say 400 opportunities to clean up your life called your menstrual cycle. So from ovulation to the onset of your period, what's called the luteal phase, everything that isn't working in your life will come up and hit you between the eyes. We call that PMS. Then, and because you live in the same uh, <clears throat> latitude that I, longitude that I do, latitude, longitude, you're in an area that's cloudy and dark in the winter, the other wake up call is seasonal affective disorder. Mm. If you start to really get depressed, come about October, November, that is the PMS of the annual cycle. Perimenopause is PMS, seasonal affective disorder, all of it on steroids. If you haven't done the work prior to that, and most people don't. Because that's the time you're building your family, you're building your career, you're maybe right. writing books, you're getting your uh, advanced degrees, you're getting your training, whatever it is. Though I have to say, I realize that a lot of the PMS and the menstrual difficulties and all of the rest of it are a signal. Have, I've always known that those maladies of women 
and fertility were a signal that the culture in which we live mm -hmm. is inimicable to that which we call womanly. Mm. Let me stop you there for a second, because I have so many questions bubbling yeah. around and okay. so many things that you just said, I want to unpack a little bit. Um, because everything you said, so obviously I'm a women's coach, you know, health oh, and life, yeah. And, yeah. you know, so everything you've just said, <laughs> kind of, that's exactly what I see. The women that approach me are, either late 30s, early to mid 40s, they're like, whoa, what's my life purpose? What happened here? And, and it's always, and it comes, a lot of it comes back to the relationship. You know, I've just realized that my husband's a narcissist, or I've just realized that I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I've spent my life, you know, I, I've spent the last kind of decade or so dealing with the kids and just totally forgetting about myself. And I have women come to my course telling me, I can't do your course because at 7.30 in the evening when it starts, I can't be away from the children because my family around me don't see the value in me having anything for me. Yep. I, yeah. So, and this is exactly what we focus on. And, and I think this is what you're talking about. It's we get to that age and the perimenopause is, is approaching and all of a sudden it, it's giving you that wisdom, but perhaps most women aren't listening to it. It's saying to you, this is the time for you. You have to think about you now. Um, and it's just interesting that you kind of related that to your own marriage, because I've been talking a lot recently about relationships. I did a podcast episode with my husband and we spoke about kind of our you know, journey to what we call yeah. conscious union and how that all had to shift and change. So it's just all very. And the, the other thing that, that you brought up that I found interesting was about the family not supporting you. And I did a post about this on Instagram a few weeks ago that for some reason, families find it the hardest to see really who we are because maybe they see us as who we were 20 30 years ago and we're constantly evolving and so they have this block surrounding being able to see our evolution whereas our friends kind of you either you you know you get new friends as you move into this new stage yeah, of true. your life yeah. who then see you for what you are and what you're trying to do and your servitude to the world but the family find that really hard and i think that's really you know, an important point that you raised and something that I'm sure women listening to this will will acknowledge because it's the thing I hear the most, you know, my husband doesn't acknowledge this or my my mum doesn't see this part of me. So anyway, I just wanted to to kind of say that. So I think what we've discussed now, which is obviously what you're saying is the most important, is the emotional aspect of how we have not kind of allowed our authenticity to come through, our true selves. What are the physical aspects of menopause is there a way physically so you we've discussed the emotionally and what needs to be done there by stepping into our power and our purpose but physically what should we be doing in the lead up and how much how long how far in advance should we be working towards preparing our bodies to transition into menopause without a struggle um first of all we know that those women who exercise have 70% less breast cancer. Mm -hmm. If they're getting in, I forget what it is, five to six hours a week. It's, you know, it's substantial. But if they exercise, they have a way decreased level of breast cancer. We know that those who have two, two alcoholic drinks a night have a way increased risk of breast cancer. But I don't think it's the wine. Mm -hmm. I think it is why they use the wine. If yeah. they're, you know, how we're always seeing in the movies, like the book club, as far as I can tell, book clubs are a chance for women to get drink together wine. And yeah. drink wine and, um, oh, fine. It's time for me to drink wine again. That wouldn't matter, but are you using it to try to feel better, to try mm -hmm. to push down emotions you don't want to feel? So I would, first of all, I would look at all of your daily habits uh, the addictions, smoking, whether that's smoking pot or smoking cigarettes, mm -hmm. uh, using any recreational um, drugs of any kind. What about um, Ambien or sleeping pills or Xanax or Valium? So many women are on psych meds. Mm -hmm. Why? Years ago, years ago, my daughter brought her acapella group up here from Yale and these are smart young women. And the number of those girls on psych meds shocked me. 
because I went into the bathroom where they were all staying just to, you know, put in some fresh towels and everyone's prescription uh, Xanax, Zoloft, Prozac oh. was up. And it was like, you are the brightest and best, allegedly, but you're on psych meds. So I would, uh, anything that you have been unable to deal with to the point where you think you need a prescription medication, I got news for you. <laughs> that's going to get worse at perimenopause. And that's mm -hmm. when we call in the SSRI shuffle. Uh, SSRI is, um, you know, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil. And the doctors will just keep shuffling you to the next one because they're never going to go near the actual thing. So what I want women to know is, please check, are you on any prescription medication? Mm. We don't need most prescription medication. My mother died at 95, was not on a single prescription medication. Mm. My friend uh, Gladys McGarry, MD, is now 100. Wow. Not on a single prescription medication. Mm. So okay. it's a lifestyle thing. It's a, it's a, it's a lifestyle thing. Where, you, where you think you need to run to the doctor and get a pill mm. or something. So do you think those women who, who are that way inclined will suffer more with menopause? Than the women who take their health care into their own hands. Oh, well, I like to... without a doubt, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. And now, if you have um, estrogen dominance, let's say you're skipping periods. So you notice that your, your period is suddenly, and in the 40s, it's often all over the place. You don't know when it's coming and uh, maybe it's heavy bleeding one month and then nothing for three months. And that's all normal. Now, I want to give some really... Uh, some tips here. If you get premenstrual migraines, which many, many women do in the perimenopausal time, uh, a little natural progesterone goes a long way. I'm not sure if you can, can you get that over the counter in the UK? Amrita? Not over the counter, but you can, you can, you get, can it. get it. Okay. So natural progesterone, stay away from synthetic hormones. If you're going to use hormones and there's a place for them, use bioidenticals. This was a big question, actually. Can, can, we, can we touch on that? I, I, I'd love know, to. We have a lot of, there was a program that came out here recently. I didn't actually watch it. It's a, a well, very well-known TV presenter here, Davina McCall. She okay. did an episode, um, she did a series on menopause. And I had friends calling me up because they know, you know how I feel about kind of the holistic approach. And they were like, you know, what, what's your view on this? Because she's saying HRT all the way and all this stuff about HRT being dangerous. And she's saying, you know, all women are going to suffer and we should, you know, reduce our suffering by taking the drugs, listen to the doctors. It was very, very, it was almost like it, it was a, an advertisement for a pharmaceutical company. Probably was. And, <laughs> and I didn't want it. It probably was. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I didn't want to watch the program because I don't want to waste my time watching it, but we hear so much stuff like that. Yeah. And I have heard from many people, well, you know, HRT is what was needed. And I don't have enough knowledge on this. So I'd love you to talk about, is there a place for HRT? Is it causing breast cancer? What is the deal with HRT? Talk to me about bioidentical hormones. This is what the women want to know. Okay, good. All right. So first of all, for many people, if they approach menopause truly healthy, where the adrenal glands are healthy, where they're well nutriented, where their body fat percentage is in the range, it should be like, you know, 22 to 28%, let's say. Uh, they're exercising, their relationships are good, they love their careers, all the rest of it. And they're making the tweaks like you're doing in your, in your coaching programs. Because if they don't, what will happen? So let me put the mind-body connection here together which is that if you are under constant stress, you have increased cortisol and uh, epinephrine, mm. which makes it impossible to lose weight because it's like you're on a steroid. It's like you're on prednisone. And it takes the excess estrogen from skipping ovulations and turns it into a catecholamine, meaning a stress hormone. So mm. it takes your own estrogen, shoots it down the path, of a stress hormone. So it's a vicious cycle. So you want to definitely make, make sure you have a practice to get deeply relaxed, whether that's meditation or yoga or prayer, something that brings you back. The other thing that I would say to all women, begin grounding 
daily if you can. The most important thing you can do because the excess inflammation just from standing barefoot on the ground, on the beach, hugging a tree, sends that the inflammatory chemicals just right into the ground. So 20 minutes standing or sitting on the ground. You can put down a towel and it works. Um, I'm we'll standing be- on a grounding mat right now. Oh, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that reminder. Cause I have one and I could put it right under my feet. Okay. So 20 minutes decreases cellular inflammation by 20% and all chronic degenerative diseases, everything, everything we fear, arthritis, cancer, osteoporosis, heart disease, diabetes, all come from cellular inflammation. So I want you to think about inflammation. What is inflamed in your life? Mm -hmm. And if any pharma, so so there are those women, and if I say, what is inflamed in your life? And the woman goes, everything. You know, like my marriage is on the rocks. My kids hate me. Um, I, you know, I, I can't afford organic food, all of that. Then for that woman, a prescription for HRT is often a way to calm things down for a while. What I like to do in general, I like to tell women, start on natural herbal things if you possibly can. So there are women for whom aromatherapy, Mm. like with uh, sage and that kind of thing, um, absolutely takes care of the symptoms. Mm. Depends on your level of sensitivity. Homeopathy can do I was it. just about to say my homeopath treats, because I know homeopath, homeopathy isn't as popular in America because it's obviously not available on your healthcare. It's not available on ours. We have to pay for it mm. out of pocket as well. But um, my homeopath treats menopause very oh, successfully, yeah. very Absol- successfully. Absolutely. Homeopathy, of course, is perfect because it is treating the whole person. Mm-hmm. So there, there's not going to be, um, oh, well, you're going through menopause, so you need this remedy. It's never going to be that way. No, exactly. So homeopathy is brilliant. Mm. That's brilliant. Um, now, what women are told is that you're going to dry up and you will have no sex life anymore. And you're going to turn into an old aged crone. And I remember a slide I used to use in my presentations um, the fate of the untreated menopause. And it would show a woman at a window and the curtains were blowing and outside was dry cracked earth, the fate of the untreated menopause. And that article was by uh, Wolf Udian, who was the head of the North American Menopause Society. And after they ended the Women's Health Initiative in 2002, they just abruptly stopped this entire gigantic study where they were studying. The question was, should all women be on HRT because it would decrease your risk of heart attack? And so at that time, believe it or not, everybody, women were told they couldn't be in a doctor's practice if they wouldn't go on HRT. If you won't do this, you can't be in my practice because you're putting your health at risk. Imagine. Mm. Oh, I had that with a rheumatologist who told me that even though I was in remission, I couldn't be in her clinic to be checked, but just to have regular checkups because I wasn't going to take her drugs. Meanwhile, I was the only person in her clinic who ever got myself into remission and I was standing there running around, but she wouldn't have me as in her clinic because I wouldn't take it. I'm like, I'm standing here without a disease. What do I need drugs for? So I, I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the orthodoxy mm-hmm. of conventional Rockefeller medicine. Mm-hmm. But they also brought you the Spanish flu epidemic. We just put that in here. Um, Anyhow, (laughs) anyway, so homeopathy, various herbs, black cohosh, um, and uh, also chaste berry, they work for many women. Uh, I created a Peraria Marifica product. It's very, it's a, a Thai herb, which has a very potent phytoestrogen in it. And what I want women to know is the regular HRT, it lands on the alpha estrogen receptor, unless you've got testosterone in there. And sometimes they put that in the prescription, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. And then it's kind of an art form of which ones you need and how much. Do you have uh, formulary pharmacies in the UK where the doctor can write an individualized prescription and then the pharmacist makes it up? 
No, not really, because of the NHS. It's uh, yeah. No, they wouldn't do that. No, they wouldn't do that. A lot of red tape. Yeah, of course, of course. Well, in the United States, of course, we have the, our ways, though. <laughs> yeah, good. in the United States, the powers that be are, of course trying to crush the formulary pharmacies mm -hmm. who do beautiful work making individual prescriptions for, for people. Um, so I have a huge experience in that from the 1990s when we started to do that in a big way. And uh, so there are those women who are on some form of estrogen, bioidentical estrogen, bioidentical progesterone, bioidentical testosterone, and they titrate the dose to their own symptoms. Now, what's interesting is I tried all of that stuff. I tried the transdermal again. If it's transdermal across the skin, mm -hmm. then it goes right into your bloodstream. It's more like having an ovary right on your, you know, on your body. Um, and I found that uh, nothing, nothing did much because I really wasn't having much in the way of symptoms. And now I can just do the you know, actually I can do just nothing and it works fine, but there's, so there's the herbs. So I would, I always tell women begin with something that's not prescription because you want to unhook mm -hmm. from the medical system as much as possible mm -hmm. because you're, you know, the old, let your medicine be food and let your food be medicine. Mm -hmm. So you go with the long time women's herbals mm -hmm. and you start there. Mm. And then if that doesn't work, and sometimes it doesn't, then you go to a prescription, but make sure that it's bioidentical. Now, the way you know it is, is you cannot patent a naturally occurring substance, which is why traditional medicine, conventional medicine has always been down on the natural things because no drug company can patent them. Mm just the way they're trying to patent human beings at this particular point in time. So it's the same people. And so you, you want to have something that's naturally occurring. Now we have naturally occurring hormones where they patented the delivery system, which I think is brilliant. So that would be the estradiol patches, Chimera, Vival, not sure what the name is in the UK, but they're the And patches. you think they're okay? You recommend those? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, because... You're going to start with the smallest dose that your body can handle. Now, that's assuming that the herbal stuff hasn't worked. The herbal stuff takes longer, yeah. like the homeopathic stuff generally takes longer because it takes the homeopath often. Yeah. Sometimes they, they get the remedy right away. But yeah. sometimes it takes a while. Yeah, it takes some perseverance. Yeah, yeah exactly. And then, you, and then you get it right. But for those who need something quick, let's say this is the biggest, that women aren't sleeping mm. and they don't sleep and then they wake up tired and then their whole life is falling apart and they just need to sleep. One of the things we find about the Prairie Marifica that within four days, people are sleeping, but the same thing with the estrogen. So with, in your, um, your audience, people can go to the NHS, I'm imagining, and get a prescription for 17 beta estradiol and get them sleeping. It's far better than a sleeping pill, let me tell you, because those are addictive. Mm. And you don't want to get addictive to this, to these things, particularly the um, things like Xanax, Valium, Ativan. Mm. Those things, uh, the benzodiazepines are so addictive. Yeah. And women, you any addiction. You need to look squarely in the face, whether that is an addiction to, uh, for those married to narcissists, the addiction in your case is the addiction to being idealized. Mm. And I learned that from a woman who was almost beaten to death by her husband and then became a, uh, an expert on the battered woman syndrome. And she said, I had to look at my part and I wanted to be the loving, all forgiving understanding person who always took him back because I could open my heart that wide. And then I realized that I would be dead. So you have to look at all of that. And what you find that's so interesting, the more you do the emotional work, the work of the soul, the work that you do, your work, the more you do that work and the more it's working, 
the less you need the drugs yeah, and the less you need anything. But um, there are, there's a certain group of women that gets vaginal dryness that just somehow the moisture just goes away. Now, what's interesting about this is the pill form or even the patch form, it should work systemically to re-estrogenize the vagina and the entire body. And sometimes it doesn't. And I don't know why. I learned this in the 80s. So those women need a topical preparation. What we're finding in the US is the topical 17 beta estradiol is now costing a fortune. It, and my sister had some surgery and went to get a prescription and it was $350. Wow. And uh, I have a vaginal moisturizer with the Amata company that's, you know, way less and does the same thing. So what I want women to know is that there are, there are alternatives available. And then here's what happens. And I really love this. Once the vaginal moisture turns on again, generally it's on and you can use the preparation maybe once a week, maybe once a month, whatever. And what I really want women to know, let me allay the biggest fear, which is that you will no longer be sexually attractive to the gender that does it for you. You no longer will be. And what I want you to know is that women in their 60s, 70s, and 80s are having the best sex of their lives. And those that's the science. Mm. That's from uh, Gina. I was going to say, is that Mama Gina? Because I was, yeah. uh, I read that you in her book. with her? No, I haven't. I've, I've read her books. She's actually coming on the podcast in the next season. So yeah. um, she's brilliant. I love her work. Absolutely. And yeah. that was the, the biggest sexuality study ever done. Yeah. And of course, it was called the ISIS study into <laughs> spirituality and sexuality. Do you think, though, that there's a connection because you talk a lot, obviously, about the emotions and how that plays a part when we're coming into menopause, if this dryness is happening and, you know, the, the, the our desire is, is changing and just everything about sexuality is changing. Could that be a link back to sexual trauma as well and anything? That oh, yes. Oh, from yes. That yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because many, many women do not remember the, mm -hmm. the trauma of childhood until menopause. Yeah. Because what's happening is the brain is waking up and um, the estrogen dominance triggers the amygdala and the basal forebrain where the memories, the somatic memories of past trauma are stored because, you know, the old what's too painful to remember, we simply choose to forget. Mm -hmm. And then at, at perimenopause, because you're going through a reboot, a rebirth, a repair, then you have to repair all that, which means it comes up to be dealt with. Mm. Now, by the way, I'd like to tell everybody, please do not waste your time try, if, it, if the memories are vague. Don't waste your time trying to figure out who it was, when it was, particularly if it's a family member or it's vague or some psychic told you that it was your father at the age of two, but you've got a good relationship with your father now. What, you, uh, what I would recommend instead is that you move into the archetype of it. That on some level, and I learned this from the medical intuitive Carolyn Mays, we've all been raped in this culture. The rape of our self-esteem, the rape of our innocence. We all have been. So therefore, please put that in the crucible of your rebirth, but do not go on an archeologic dig where you spend the next 10 years of your life trying to figure out who the perpetrator was, because mm. what it will do is it will put you in perpetual victimhood. Mm. Now, yes, you need what you need to do at this point. Okay, this is the medicine. You become the adult in the room for the unhealed child within yourself. Inner child healing. That's inner child healing. And it's very potent. We had a movement in the 80s that I remember it would sort of drive me nuts. Take your inner child to work. Some people would bring teddy bears. Do not bring your inner child to work. This is not the place for them. 
Deal with your inner child. And then uh, Dr. Doris E. Cohen, with whom I did seven years of dream work, has an amazing process on her website, drdorisecohen.com, D-R Cohen, C-O-H-E-N.com, Dr. Delor Doris E. Cohen.com. And it's called The Seven Steps of Rebirth. And she takes you through seven steps where you go into a magic garden, you meet the inner child. You interact with the child as the adult you are now. And then you bring, and then you grow that child up by basically saying to the inner child, who by the way, most of the time is running your central nervous system, your endocrine system, and your immune system. Does this relate at all, by the way, to the rheumatoid arthritis that you had? Was there a, a childhood thing that you can remember that maybe triggered the autoimmunity? Well, a vaccine triggered it when I was, okay. when I yeah. was, before I was two. So yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Okay. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there, there you were. Okay. Again, that, that's that whole constellation. There were other things, you know, I always say it's never one thing in isolation. My, my mom got an infection after she gave birth to me. So she couldn't breastfeed me. She couldn't hold me for two weeks. That yeah. obviously played a huge part. I have MTHFR. So the vaccine was going to have I was going to be more susceptible, more genetically yeah, definitely. susceptible, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And, and these are all the pieces I've put together over the years. But inner child healing has been a massive part of my journey and a massive part of my physical healing. And it's something I now teach in my course and to my clients because it, it, it's, it. It's, 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 massive, it, it's totally it's it. necessary. And in a way, I'm thinking um, that's what we came, that's what we gave birth for. I mean, I really, what I say to people is, my entire career in OBGYN, as illustrious as it's been, has been nothing more than an attempt to heal my relationship with my mother. So let's boil it right down. So what I want everyone listening to do is you figure out what it is that you're trying to heal. And I will guarantee you that the people who signed up to be your parents, your brother, your sister, your husband, the people who signed up are the people doing that role of soul making mm. for you. And as, as awful it is, as it is, because we don't want to go there because the inner child, let me be really clear now, no, no wound heals until it's witnessed. So you need to say to that little kid inside, usually it's, it's seven years old or younger, mm. that happened to you and it was not okay. Yeah. And then I'm certain that you have processes that you teach women. Obviously, there's grounding. There is the deep process, weeping. There's um, smashing things. <laughs> there's you know, beating a hand towel against a door frame, anything like that, because you have to move it out of the right. physical body. Yeah. There's just no way around it. And if you, if you take a pill to smash it down, then it's just going to get louder and louder and louder and louder. Mm. And that's why we see so much chronic degenerative illness later in life. Yeah. It is not normal for the human vessel to deteriorate after the age of 50. Mm. It's not, it, in fact, what I'd like women to, to know is the childbearing years are a really short time in your life. Mm. And oh, and by the way, here's another issue at perimenopause, and that's what the Germans call Torschluck panic. And it is the panic at a door closing, and there's nothing you can do about it. And if you haven't had a child, you're going to have to come to grips with that. And there's a million ways to use the nurturing. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say about when you were talking about family, not seeing you, because for most women, not all, the role of nurturer, the role of provider. I mean, you know, I love giving my daughters gifts that they love. I love providing a, a beautiful guest room, a, a, a meal. It is very satisfying. So what we do is we overshoot, but it comes from a really good place. But then the family doesn't recognize you be, because they have gotten a free maid service for their whole lives. And if mom finally finds herself, who's going to do the shopping? Who's going to make the meals? Who's going to do the laundry? I mean, it's uh, uh, primitive. 
but there it is. You have given, um, you know, I was talking with a friend of mine and who's got, she's raising two stepsons. And I said, have you noticed that the only thing they go for in the refrigerator is the food that you have touched? They will not touch a carrot, but if you cut it into carrot sticks, it's gone. It's anything that you have mm. imbued, any food you've imbued with your energy, they will gobble up any pre preparation that you have done. Mm. If it's just the raw ingredients, they will stay there until they mold. That's the power. And I want women to see this. This is power, but you must fill your own cup first. You must fill your own cup first. And you're going to feel like you're being selfish. Why? Because for 5,000 years, you've been told that self-development is selfish, mm. or you've been told that you don't know how to do money. The, the truth is I'd like every woman to know that she's better at it than men. Women Absolutely. are better at money than men. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've, I've got it right here, actually. Your goddess is never age, which I just love. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you talk about in there, and you talk about it quite a lot, I think in your other books as well, is pleasure and self-care and that's something that women you know have just shut themselves off for as it's like a self-indulgence as yes. opposed to how necessary it is and how it's actually you know good for humanity and so women need to know that you know what they the, the hormones and the, the energies that they create and the energy that they emanate when they're happy and they're joyful which is something you talk a lot about in the book is actually when you're emanating that out into the field, you're helping humanity, that servitude. And we, we, but we've been taught not to do that. We've been told that it's selfish if we're putting ourselves in any way first. That's right. But and then the people who are really good at putting themselves first, the narcissists or the borderlines, they get all the attention. Yeah. And so you, you look at them and you go, what? What does she have that I don't have? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, she's got a personality disorder um, that sucks everybody in. And second of all, she puts herself first. In every single circumstance, she puts herself first. Mm -hmm. And because she does, everything is kind of a dance, a duality. Mm -hmm. She's expecting to be served. And so you, you serve her. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and there's, a, of course, a balance. It's not, I'm, you know, we're not saying... Yeah you know, put yourself, and as a mother, you, you can't, you know, you, you're always going to put your children first to an extent, but this is about allowing yourself, giving yourself the permission to have pleasure and to have fun. And Absolutely. And what you find is your children respect that when you say, well, okay, they'll learn from it. They, they do learn from it. Just like I remember meeting a, uh, a guy who had four kids, every child had a job. I mean, the seven-year-old vacuumed the house and did a great job. And mm. then their self-esteem improves. Mm. When you expect something of your child, okay, you live here, this is what you do. Then they grow into adults instead of men who expect their wives to be yeah. their mothers. And by the way, if you'd like to kill your sex life quickly, <laughs> then be his mother. <laughs> <laughs> just another thing before we before we wrap up um that I want to just quickly touch on is you talk a lot about sleep being a tonic and how necessary it is now a lot of my audience are young mums um yeah I myself my three-year-old still doesn't sleep and I wonder and I'm hoping you can answer this for me have because my son also never slept he's just started sleeping at, at you know at five he's six now have I shaved years off my life because of six years of very, very bad sleep? Or will I be able to catch up on it? Because you talk so much about sleep and I agree, you know, we need this sleep and we need, you know, we need to have that rest time. But when you can't do anything about that and you have got, you know, you're breastfeeding through the night and then, you know, it carries on and your kids just, I don't know, for some reason still wake up, even after you stop breastfeeding, have, are you going to be able to kind of, because I feel like I've aged a lot simply because of not of, of having these sleepless nights. Yes, yes, um, believe me. Okay, so as an OBGYN, I had years and years and years of sleepless nights because I'd have to get up in the middle of the night, go in and uh, help with delivering a baby. And I had a, a, a daughter who I would go into her bed and I'd attach her to the breast and breastfeed before I left so that, uh, you know, whether she was hungry or not. Mm -hmm. And so I had years and years and years of sleeplessness. 
And believe me, I'm making up, I begin to make up for them later. And the other thing that happens now is there are times when I will sleep for a solid 12 hours because that's what the body needs. Mm -hmm. And I used to feel guilty about it because we're made to feel guilty if we right. need sleep. Oh, you lazy bum, get up, we're burning mm -hmm. daylight, all of that. Um, believe me, you will be able to reverse all of that and rather quickly. I think a lot of any, my audience will be happy to hear yeah, that. Do you have any times though, uh, here's, here's what my daughter does. She's got a um, three and a six-year-old now. And every chance she gets, she and her husband will book a hotel room, <clears throat> book a hotel room, like I'm going to, to visit them. And, uh, and they said, okay, so how about this? Could you spend this night with the kids? And then we'll go to your hotel <laughs> <laughs> for the night. It's like, yes. Yeah. So um, they're, they're very good at this. I have to say the sins of the mother were not carried on to the daughter because my, my daughter's make sure that they get sleep because I've always given them permission to. Mm. And so if you can get away and bring in somebody to spend the night with the kids, first of all, I can assure you any behavior that your children have that they uh, have with you, they will never have with someone who's coming in. You always yeah. hear that. Oh my God, your children were perfect angels, really. And then you walk in the door and they lose it. This is just classic. It's standard. The mother is like the mother earth. The mother earth, if you scream into the earth or you put your inflammation into the earth, she will take it and process it for you. The physical mother in the home is taking all of the stuff that a mm -hmm. child will not, knows that they cannot process with anyone else. They will give you their worst shit always and mothers need to know that and then oftentimes the father will say they're not like that with me you're bringing that out of them no mm -hmm. you're not that's just what it is yeah I love that how the way you've just explained that so I I'd love for you to, we've kind of been through the emotional element the physical element um you know talked about bioidentical hormones HRT all of those elements of you know bringing together this transition for menopause before we wrap up what what are your just kind of bullet point um solutions for transitioning into a more pleasurable menopause all right <clears throat> one know that it gets better this is not going to last forever so you're in a rocky period like this and then it will smooth out so see it as as bad as it can be there's life on the other side. And also any great loss that you go through, maybe loss of a relationship, loss of your fertility, whatever. I want you to use that as compost. Uh, the life, uh, this was said by Joseph Campbell, we must give up the life we had planned in order to have the life that is waiting for us. So mm -hmm. what I want you to do, your, your visualization is the life that is waiting for you and spend some time every day What's in the life that is waiting for me? Mm. And also, I want to okay. give you a very concrete exercise. And it is from Stephen Vera Bedansky's book, The Illustrated Guide to Extended Massive Orgasm. There is a, a thing in there called Visiting Dignitary. It is an exercise, Visiting Dignitary. And what it is, it's a self-pleasuring exercise. And your goal, as it were, is to, with your own hands, not a vibrator, bring yourself to orgasm within a 30 minute time frame. Now, the reason why this is so important is that when you set aside time for this, as though it is weightlifting, except it's the opposite, you are actually through a biofeedback model, learning how to turn on all the nerve endings in the clitoral area that are associated with pleasure. Those need to be addressed. What you focus on expands and neurons that are fired together, wire together. And I want women to become familiar with their female erotic anatomy. We have as much erectile erotic tissue in our bodies as do men. Theirs is all on the outside. 
Ours is all on the inside. It's every bit as much. And when you learn what it feels like to turn that erotic system on, you have a GPS for your life. Mm -hmm. Because, and this isn't about getting laid, this is about you tuning into that sacral area, that sacred life force area of your body that you can use to guide you. So as we're sitting here, I'd like women to just focus on what's below the waist, the female erotic anatomy, and see if as I'm talking, you can feel that turning on. That's being in your center. That's being in your goddess energy. And you can tune into that anytime, and that will get you out of your head immediately. And it's also a very powerful way to instantly center yourself. And you'll find that when you're in that space, and if you've been sexually abused, chances are very good, this is gonna give you, you're gonna get afraid. That's okay, that's part of the healing. And then they can work with you and get, get all that figured out. But when you go you deep, deep into that area and turn that area on, you are in your ultimate GPS guidance system. Go there and then move from there. And you can do uh, some hip circles, actually do some wide hip circles, and that gets you into your soul. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much. As You're always, welcome. it's just an absolute pleasure. And just, I just love watching you talk. There's so much passion in you when you talk. So thank you again. Thank you for everything you're doing for us right now, for all this stuff we're still going through, um, right. which we are winning. <laughs> yes, we are winning. Yes. And I um, think we'll be a lot more winning in the next couple months. Yes. I feel it. I really feel it. Thank you Definitely. so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. And thank you also for taking responsibility for your well-being by listening to podcasts like this. It's something I really appreciate. And before you go, I just wanted to remind you to check out the Recondition Your Life Academy at laurenvacneencoaching.com. It's a 12-week course that I run three times a year for small tribes of like-minded women. If you love anything you're hearing here on the podcast, this course will serve you so so deeply. Everything from inner child healing, divine feminine healing and health optimization to how to find your purpose and how to find or cultivate conscious relationships and so much more. Check out all the testimonials on the website from some very happy previous Academy members. The growth and healing available in this course really is unique. Just head over to the website and make sure to get your name on the waiting list for when we launch the next semester. Sending so much love your way.